Winds of up to 100 miles an hour hit the UK as Storm Doris blows in. There's been widespread damage on the roads and the railways with flights cancelled at Heathrow. Thousands of homes are without power. I can tell you, as you see the foam hitting me from the sea, that it definitely has materialised. The gusts here are so powerful, I can't even face in the direction that the wind is coming from. We'll be speaking to our correspondents in some of the areas worst affected in Scotland and in the northwest of England. Also this lunchtime. Net migration falls for the first time in two years, although it remains well above the government's target. Iraqi forces seize Mosul airport from Islamic State. We have a special report. Prisons are explicitly to become places of rehabilitation as well as punishment under new government plans. We caught the hands are on fire. A new sound for smoke alarms. Safety experts say a voice rather than a beep is much more likely to wake children up. And the speeding driver who clocked up 62 points on his licence who's legally allowed to drive. In the south, a minute's silence for the four men who died when part of Didcot power station collapsed a year ago today. And police in Wiltshire uncover a huge cannabis factory hidden in a former nuclear bunker. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. Storm Doris has hit the UK with gusts of wind of up to 100 miles an hour. Planes have been grounded, roads closed and rail travel disrupted. In Northern Ireland, thousands of homes are without power and in Scotland, heavy snow and high winds led to the closure of the M80 near Stirling. The storm is predicted to continue for much of the day and in the last few minutes we've had reports that a woman has been killed in Wolverhampton city centre in a weather-related incident. Well, let's get the latest from our correspondent Daniel Bircher. Throughout the morning winds have been picking up as Storm Doris has swept across the country. This is the seafront at Blackpool. There are severe weather warnings for parts of Northern England, East Anglia, North Wales and the Midlands. Forecasters describe the storm as a weather bomb, an area of intense low pressure and this is some of the damage it has already caused. A car crushed by a fallen tree in West London and more damage, this time in County Fermanagh. Trees have also brought down power lines. Three and a half thousand homes and businesses in Northern Ireland have been left without electricity. These images from the International Space Station show the storm building up earlier today. Storm Doris is an example of a weather bomb, a rapidly intensifying area of low pressure that have brought severe gales across large areas of the UK. We've already had wind gusts over 90 miles an hour. We have had disruption to power supplies. We've also had disruption to transport. Those kind of strength winds can easily knock trees down, cause those kind of problems. Problems for air travel too. This is Leeds Bradford Airport and Heathrow says its schedule has been reduced by 10% because of the weather with some delays and cancellations. And on the rails too, the storm has caused some disruption. 50 mile an hour speed limits have been imposed on several lines, including the West Coast Main Line. And earlier departures from Euston Station were suspended, though they have now started running again. The centre of the storm is due to track towards the North Sea, but the strong winds are expected to last throughout the afternoon. And in Scotland, crews have been out clearing roads with poor driving conditions caused by a combination of snow, sleet and high winds. The biggest problems have been on higher routes, mainly in central and southern areas. And in places, up to 30 centimetres of snow is expected during the day. Daniel Bircher, BBC News. Well, in a moment, we'll be speaking to Lorna Gordon, who's near Dunblane. But first, let's cross to Alison Freeman, who's on the Golden Mile in Blackpool. Alison, we saw you a little earlier, almost unable to stand up. It doesn't look much better now. It isn't, Rita. And actually, we've just watched this storm unfold throughout the morning as the wind has become more and more powerful. It's so strong at the moment, I, I can't look into it. And this foam that's being blown from the sea is actually a bit more like being in a blizzard. Now, if you look behind us, the uh, barometer for how strong the wind has been has been those bending sculptures, which are meant to bend in the wind in front of Blackpool Tower. They've become 
almost sort of parallel with the ground at points today. And if you look out to sea, um, those waves really are far back now. The tide has gone out, but that uh, foam keeps blowing in against us. Now, these winds really are strong and powerful. They're pushing us around, making us feel battered, very much like the coastline. Um, we know that they're expected to stay at this peak until about six o'clock this evening. Back to you, Rita. And Lorna, near Dunblane, the area's clearly been hit by a very icy, icy spell. Yeah, some roads and some schools closed here in Scotland. Uh, Storm Doris dumping snow across large swathes of the country and the timing couldn't have been worse really. The worst of it hit as many people were heading to work. This road is running clearly but the A9 further north has had problems and the M80 further south, well there has been appalling conditions there. That is one of the main roads in Scotland and it ground completely to a halt earlier on today. The road had been treated but it was the sheer uh, weight of traffic on heavy snow and some cars and lorries having problems uh, with traction. The road though is now clear, uh, there's been power cuts, some schools closed and this weather warning is in place until six o'clock this evening. Okay Lorna, many thanks. Lorna Gordon there and Alison Freeman as well. Ministers are calling it the biggest reform of prisons in England and Wales for a generation. For the first time, the government will state in black and white that a key purpose of prison is to reform offenders as well as to punish them. At the heart of the changes will be dealing with drugs and violence in prison and also cutting reoffending rates. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford. Ron. The last year has been one of the worst for prisons since the 1990s. As the staff cuts of five years ago started to bite and phones and drugs flooded in, violence soared. Some jails have been close to crisis point. But there are prisons like HMP Onley in Warwickshire, which despite their own problems of drugs and violence, still manage to prepare inmates for life on the outside. Abdi Tahir is coming to the end of a two-year sentence for violence and is training for a job as a bike technician at Halfords. He told me his experience of jail has been mixed. When I was in Pentonville, for example, before I came here, we were locked up 23 hours of the day. You know what I'm saying? Literally treated like animals. You know what I'm saying? We had to ask for toilet paper. We had to ask for the basic common decency. You know what I'm saying? So coming here now, it looks like a completely different prison. At the heart of the government's new proposals is the decision to define for the first time in law what the purpose of prison is. And that is not only to punish, but also to rehabilitate, to prevent criminals offending again. And as well as today's Prisons and Courts Bill, the Justice Secretary Liz Truss is also reversing many of the cuts made by one of her Tory predecessors, Chris Grayling. Those cuts in the Chris Grayling era were a mistake, weren't they? Well, I think it was always right to look at how we can be more efficient. But what I am saying now is we do need the right number of prison officers to be able to turn those lives around. In Only Prison's training cafe, a reminder of why rehabilitation is important. A drug dealer serving seven years who'd been to prison before. It hadn't stopped him reoffending. Once I got released, I actually tried to search for a job, but I wasn't qualified for anything. I had no know-how. Therefore, I got back into old ways and ended up back in jail. Today's bill also includes measures to tackle mobile phones in prison, new laws to help the prison service detect and intercept devices often used to deal drugs and organised crime from behind bars. Labour said the proposals were an inadequate response to a prison's crisis that developed on the government's watch. And we can talk to Daniel, who's outside Pentonville, Pentonville Prison in North London for us now. Daniel, how big a change exactly is being proposed here? Well, it's certainly an end now to that period when Chris Grayling was in charge of prisons, when really the focus was on cutting costs, almost uh, at all costs. And I think that's over now, and there's a realisation in the government that actually, if you reduce costs too far, then prisons do become less safe places and places that are more difficult to control. This was a process that was started by Michael Gove last year and has been continuation, continuing with the uh, new recruitment of prison officers uh, with a different 
government approach uh, to prisons and now this prisons bill which says that rehabilitation is at the core of what they do. But this is, of course, not an easy thing to do. What's happened over the last decade or so is that drugs and mobile phones have become such a central part of life in prisons. To try and squeeze that out is going to be very difficult. Violence has come alongside the drugs, which cause violence, and alongside the mobile phones, which generate opportunities for blackmail and so on and so forth. So it is a massive, massive task. And there is still a problem that many people have been killed in old, squalid prisons and and rehabilitating him in those conditions is not going to be easy. Daniel, thank you. Net migration to the UK has fallen to its lowest level in two years. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that the difference between the number of people arriving in and leaving the UK dipped below 300,000 in the year to the end of September. Figures also show that a record number of EU nationals were granted UK residence cards last year. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw is with me. Um, Danny, the net migration figures down for the first time in two years. The government will be pleased with that? Yes, I think this is good news for the government, politically very significant. In statistical terms, perhaps not quite there. Um, what these figures show is net migration. That's the difference between the number of people coming to live in Britain for 12 months and people emigrating from the UK. And they showed that in the 12 months to September, the figure was 273,000. That's the lowest for two years. And it's, it represents a fall of 49,000 on the year before, though there is some caution with that in terms of the statistical significance. So it is edging closer to the government's target of under 100,000 and it may, it might just be a sign that some people don't want to live in the UK after the EU referendum, but it's very, very early days to draw firm conclusions about that. And just briefly, Danny, how do you interpret the residence figures? Well, these are figures uh, about the number of people from the EU and three other European countries who are who have been issued with cards proving that they have the right to stay in the UK. They have that right after five years. They don't have to get those cards, but they are clearly worried, some of them, about their status after Brexit, and they are applying for the cards and being granted them in very big numbers, 65,000 uh, last year. That's a, a massive increase, treble the number the previous year. And there are also figures on citizenship are also up significantly. Citizenship for, for EU nationals being allowed to stay in the UK permanently. Danny, many thanks. The murderer of the children's author, Helen Bailey, has been sentenced to life in prison after being convicted of her killing. The judge said that Ian Stewart would have to spend at least 34 years behind bars, saying it was difficult to imagine a more heinous crime. Stewart drugged and suffocated Helen Bailey before throwing her body in a cesspit hidden under the garage of their Hertfordshire home. Now, it's taken four years to get through Parliament, but today the go-ahead will finally be given for work to begin on the first phase of the high-speed rail link between London and Birmingham. Critics say the project is a waste of money and will damage the environment, but supporters say it'll boost the economy and the number of people able to travel by rail. Phase one is due to open in 2026 at a cost of more than £55 billion. Ben Thompson reports. More of us are using the railways than ever before. It means busier stations and busier trains, and so the government says HS2 is the answer. But is it? I'm taking a journey on the first stage of the route from London to Birmingham to see what impact it could have. The biggest challenge is tackling overcrowding. Our current tracks and stations can't handle many more passengers. But as well as running more frequently, the trains will be faster too. And that's good news for passengers. Thank you. Sometimes uh, you don't get enough carriages, which can be a problem, and then it's really crowded on the trains as a lot of people are standing up. I regard being on a train as work time, so if you don't get to sit down, then you feel really frustrated about that lost hour. But it's not just commuters who stand to gain from the new railway. We are going to average about 10,000 jobs um, over the course of the first phase of construction, peaking at 25,000 jobs a month. Um, and that's just during the construction phase. When we go into operation again, we'll have tens of thousands of jobs that are, that are maintaining and running the railway. But there could be an even greater economic benefit too. Take this journey, for example. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. We're 50 minutes into the journey, but if this was an HS2 train, we'd already be in Birmingham. And that means spending less time traveling and more time working. 
and one estimate suggests that could add about £15 billion to the economy. But at what cost? The current price tag is close to £60 billion, but many say it could be much higher. 60 ancient woodlands would have to be bulldozed, 350 homes will have to be demolished, and thousands of businesses will be affected. Like this farm in Buckinghamshire. The land will be split in two when work begins. Well, it's going to completely alter the way I farm. Now I lose half the grazing that my cows can go out to. I'm not seriously convinced that the HS2 is of any necessity to this country at all. The first section to the West Midlands is due to open by 2026. An extension to Leeds and Manchester will open by 2032. HS2 should make journeys faster and more comfortable. We're just on the approach into our final destination for today's journey, which is Birmingham New Street. But keeping the project on time and on track could prove more difficult. Ben Thompson, BBC News in Birmingham. The Iraqi army has captured Mosul airport from fighters from self-styled Islamic State. The battle for the western half of the city began earlier this month and the capture of the airport will be seen as a major strategic victory in the fight for the country's second biggest city. Our correspondent Quentin Somerville is the only western correspondent travelling with Iraqi government forces and he sent this report. You can hear gunfire in one of the last remaining villages between Iraqi forces and Mosul airport. These armoured columns that you see are moving forward from multiple directions. If we, and also up above, we can hear coalition aircraft. Those aircraft have been hammering this area all night long in preparation for this attack. At the same time, the Iraqi government have been dropping leaflets, warning people to stay in their homes. When we were here yesterday, we were able to see in some of the areas just to the north of us, the Islamic State flag still flying. Well, these men are going to try and change that because the attack on Mosul airport is now underway. Iraqi forces have made it to the perimeter of Mosul's airport. Just over this berm, you can see the airport stretching out. It's about four kilometers uh, wide, apparently. Uh, that sugar factory, which is just to the left of the picture, Yesterday the IS flag was hanging from there, it's no longer hanging there now. All around this area there have been heavy airstrikes, we can see massive craters. The village behind us, which was the last redoubt really of the Islamic State before the airport, it was effectively taken last night. The men have been moving slowly forward through that village. If we just have a little look, you can see it there. We're now on the airfield of Mosul Airport. That's the Iraqi flag you can see flying there. Those are federal police units. And in the distance, you can see burning and smoke from some of the terminal buildings. In the last few minutes, actually, the so-called Islamic State have been mortaring this position, just a bit further ahead, in fact. Now, an armored column of Iraqi security forces were going down the main road towards the airport when one of them uh, hit a uh, roadside bomb, an IED. A lieutenant was killed. We believe there were other casualties as well. You might be able to hear there are helicopters still up ahead. They're going to press on uh, with their attack on the airport to try and make it to the terminal buildings. That's the target. Iraqi forces are now inside Mosul airport. Uh, correspondent Quentin Somerville reporting there from outside Mosul. The time is now 18 minutes past one. Our top story this lunchtime. Storm Doris has brought widespread disruption across large swathes of the UK. In Wolverhampton, a woman has died in a weather-related incident. I can tell you, as you see the foam hitting me from the sea, that it definitely has materialised. The gusts here are so powerful, I can't even face in the direction that the wind is coming from. And coming up in South today, 51 penalty points and still driving. New figures reveal exactly how many motorists in the South have avoided a driving ban. And the robot that can tell how you're feeling, a glimpse into the future of artificial intelligence. Now, we're all told to fit fire alarms in our homes, but new research suggests that when they go off like this... 
most children aren't woken up by the noise. The study was carried out after a fire in Derby in 2013, which killed six children. It had been deliberately started by the parents, but investigators think the children died because they didn't hear the smoke detectors going off. So now they're developing new alarms specially designed to wake children, as our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh now reports. Smoke alarms save lives, but last year 300 people died in fires in England alone, too often where there was no working alarm in the home. Derbyshire Fire Service used this old shipping container to train fire investigators. Let's see how quickly a blaze would spread in a bedroom. The smoke alarm in this demonstration activated within seconds of the fire starting, giving minutes to escape. But research by Derbyshire Fire and Dundee University found that children are often not roused by the sound of a standard smoke detector. Melanie Wilkins from Mansfield has tested her smoke alarm many times at night and only once has any of her four boys woken up. We caught the house is on fire. Now she's trying something different, an alarm with a lower pitched tone we caught the house is on fire. and a human voice. It wakes all four boys immediately. It's like a voice of a parent uh, that they're used to listening to day in and day out and maybe subconsciously that's what they're hearing um, when the alarm's going off. Good boy. The new alarm was designed with the help of her uncle, Dave Koss, a fire investigator. OK. Oh. Good boy. Ready? Prompted by a notorious case in Derby when these six children died in a house fire deliberately set by their father, Mick Philpot. What's this? Dave Koss says more often than not, smoke alarms simply don't wake children. Unfortunately, that was the first one that brought it to my attention, but since that day, I can probably recount at least half a dozen fires where children have failed to respond from sleep and have then become trapped the wrong side of a fire and unfortunately died. Derbyshire Fire Service and Dundee University want 500 families to test the prototype alarm. Researchers predict that alarms with a human voice will eventually be commonplace. We caught the house is on fire. Quite often we hear alarms going off. We don't quite know whether they're just a warning or whether it's for real. So putting the human voice into that I think is going to be one of the key important additional things that we'll bring to alarms in the future. Fire investigators stress that standard smoke alarms are still vital in every home. They do wake adults, but parents need to know it could be up to them to wake their children in the event of a fire. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. British Gas saw its profits fall by 11% to £553 million, but the profits of its parent company, Centrica, rose to £1.5 billion, prompting calls for them to hold prices in the face of higher energy costs and a weaker pound. Here's our industry correspondent, John Moylan. At British Gas, we've got some great news for our customers. There has been good news from British Gas recently. The UK's biggest energy supplier is freezing its standard tariffs till August. It's even launched a loyalty scheme. It hopes that will stop customers leaving, one of the reasons why its profits have been hit. In 2016, British Gas made £553 million, supplying energy to domestic customers. That was down 11% on the previous year. It says that's in part because it lost 409,000 customer accounts as households switch to other suppliers. The reason it's down is because of competitive intensity. We lost customers in the first half of last year. The pricing pressure has resulted in a reduction in, in margins in general. And there have been some other cost pressures coming into the system. A price cap to protect customers on prepayment meters will also cost the firm £50 million this year. But that didn't prevent criticism of the level of British Gas's profits. Consumers are paying way over the odds for their energy, so we've got vulnerable consumers in particular paying way too much, older people and lower income people. And it all underlines again that the fact that the energy market is just not working for consumers. Price rises by rival firms have put energy back on the political agenda. The government has threatened to intervene, but the boss of Centrica, which owns British Gas, insists that there's no case for wide-ranging price controls. This market is extremely competitive. We've got 50 suppliers. 
Our margins are down year on year, and I do not believe it's healthy for governments to find themselves in the position of setting prices, because once you do it once, when do you stop? There was no word today on whether British Gas will hike prices later this year. As for government intervention, a consumer green paper is due in the spring. John Moylan, BBC News. In a week's time, the people of Northern Ireland go to the polls to vote in elections for a new assembly. It was triggered because of a row over a green energy scheme that went over budget. But if the DUP and Sinn Féin are, expect, are as expected the main winners in the vote, what are the chances of them being able to form a new power-sharing government? Well, let's cross to Belfast and to our island correspondent, Chris Buckler. Chris. Rita, I'm the Titanic Quarter, where there's been a lot of new development over the last decade, but the old divisions are clear at Stormont, with the DUP and Sinn Féin exchanging harsh words over Brexit, same-sex marriage, education and other issues. It all leads you to a position where you have a very divisive election. But are the people as divided as the politicians? To find out, I've been speaking to a group at Queen's University in Belfast. Elections are a time when people come together, united in the task of making a choice, but often divided in their views. And sometimes that can be because of their age, background or beliefs. I'm just going to ask you a number of questions. We obviously need you to be honest. Who has been to the gym in the last week? <laughs> there are the athletic, or at least the enthusiastic. <laughs> the romantics who sent Valentine's cards this year. <laughs> and those prepared to admit, Jim, Jim. or perhaps forced to admit, that they've been drunk in the last week. But it's shared experiences that could influence how individuals vote. Who has waited four hours or more in accident and emergency to get treatment for themselves or someone else? waiting lists in Northern Ireland are among the longest in the UK and Stormont's politicians have described the health service here as at breaking point. I'm an emergency nurse. There isn't enough investment in primary care and the community. We have to remove the politicians out of health. We have to appoint someone who's in charge of it who'll be responsible for all the operational matters. This isn't scientific. But the responses suggest much connects these businessmen and farmers, students and senior citizens. Who has a close friend or a relative who is gay or lesbian? Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK where same-sex marriage is still illegal. I think it's a disgrace. I think everybody has the right to decide who they want to marry, who they love and whatever. I'm not quite sure. I've always believed that there should be a male and a female to bring up a child. While many here feel they don't fit into Northern Ireland's traditional boxes of unionist or nationalist, that's how the majority vote. Who's proud of Northern Ireland? I think it's very interesting, Chris, that the split is nearly right across the, the, the generation who never knew the conflict, and yet they're not proud of their country. The reason it really sucks is because there is that much we could be proud of, but we have an executive marked by scandal, crisis and just fallen apart consistently. Different views will influence that election result when voters mark their preferences in the boxes next week. Well, so far this election campaign has really reflected the weather. It's been pretty stormy. And while the opposition parties hope to make gains, it may well be down to the DUP and Sinn Féin to make a deal if power sharing is to return. And that could be difficult. Chris, thank you. Chris Buckler there. And for more information, including the candidates standing, just go to our website at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Now, the BBC has learned that around 10,000 motorists were still driving last month despite having too many penalty points on their licence. Usually drivers are banned when they exceed 12 points, but magistrates were allowed to, are allowed to waive the rule in cases of exceptional hardship. Supporters say it gives drivers another chance, but critics say bending the rules puts other people at risk. Our correspondent David Rhodes has more. From speeding to drink driving, failing to have insurance or causing a collision on the road, penalty points are given to motorists when they break the law. Twelve active points on a licence usually means a driver will be banned for a minimum of six months. But figures obtained by the BBC 
show that just under 10,000 drivers are still on the roads despite having 12 or more points. Most are found in England, with the largest number being in Greater London, although one driver in West Yorkshire is still on the road despite having more than 60 points on their licence. The law doesn't seem to be working at the moment. We've got uh, people obviously being caught and, and going through the justice system, but actually this whole point system seems to be making a mockery of that. Um, drivers are getting away with uh, repeatedly breaking the law. Motorists with 12 points can appeal to a magistrate's court such as this one and claim that a driving ban would bring exceptional hardship upon their lives, meaning they'd lose a job or be unable to care for a family member. There is no definition in law, though, as to what exceptional hardship means. So one magistrate may decide that if a driving ban would cause someone to lose their job, that is exceptional hardship. Another magistrate may decide it isn't. Every ban is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The government says the vast majority of drivers with 12 points are automatically disqualified and only in exceptional circumstances can judges decide not to issue a ban. The fact remains, though, that there are drivers who have continually broken the law who are still on our roads. David Rhodes, BBC News, Bradford. Let's look at the weather now. Here's John Hammond. John. Hi, Rita. And as we've seen, Doris is a serious storm. Rain, wind and snow. The storm has been hurtling towards us over the last few hours. It's not done with us yet. Still a sting in the tail for some before it careers off into other parts of northern Europe and causes some mayhem there. Now, the snowfall earlier on this morning extended a little bit further northwards, perhaps than we'd first anticipated. There was some disruptive snowfall across uh, some areas, particularly north of the central bout. A winter wonderland for some, but a bit of a headache getting to work for others. That snow has been pivoting and heading a little bit further southwards now. Still an amber warning in force, uh, specifically for parts of southern Scotland, especially up over the high ground before it eases away. Some wintry showers pushing in across northern Ireland, a cold afternoon here. Now, further south, uh, some bands of rain around, but uh, the main story, of course, is the wind. Uh, I'm putting on the gusts here in the black circles, 50, 60 miles an hour, and in some places, as we've seen, those gusts can cause some real problems. And, uh, yeah, scenes like this earlier on in Chiswick in West London, an amber warning in force and still a swathe of potentially disruptive and damaging winds uh, through this afternoon. Uh, 60 or 70 miles an hour gusts will cause some issues over the next few hours. Gradually, the worst of the gusts will ease away eastwards, last to clear away uh, from the east coast of England. But then the message is Doris will be clearing and the weather will be settling down. But wintry showers will be pushing in from the west and with a lot of surface water, dipping temperatures, ice will be a hazard across Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of northwest England too. There are warnings in force. Could well be a slippery start to your Friday morning. A chilly one, but a much more tranquil day on Friday. So welcome sunshine, sparkling start across so many parts of England. Well, still one or two showers on the breeze, particularly around coastal areas, they'll clear away. But then more rain turns up across the Northern Ireland initially, pushing in across Scotland, turning to a period of snow up over the highlands. Temperatures slow to rise, but temperatures will continue to rise as we head into the weekend. And in combination with further active fronts pushing in across the north and the west of the UK, we're going to see a lot of surface water from the heavy rain and uh, a lot of snow melt too. So problems on the horizon, we think, across parts of the northwest of the UK, particularly perhaps across northwest England, we could see some flooding. We'll keep an eye on that. Further south and east on Saturday and again on Sunday, a lot of dry weather, albeit quite cloudy at times. All the action, all the rain will be further north and west. Blustery, but thankfully not as windy as it is just now. Rita. John, thank you. A reminder now of our main story this lunchtime. Storm Doris has brought widespread disruption across large swathes of the UK. In Wolverhampton, a woman has died in a weather-related incident. Well, that is all from the BBC News at One, so it's goodbye from me. And on BBC One, we can now join the BBC's news teams where you are. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.